You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. This is Ken Vellante with Something Rather Than Nothing podcast, and I am actually super excited. I have Steph Littlebird on the show, and I encountered her art on um, on Instagram. Uh, was just uh, wowed uh, by the images, and really was just digging um, what she had to say. And, and, and in your spirit, Steph. Steph, welcome to the podcast. So pleased to have you on. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be on and chat with you this evening. Yeah, yeah. It's well. It's great to have you. As I said, and um, uh, Steph, let's let's launch into um, it's 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 a, a beginning question or an origin question, um, but it has to do about creativity and humans. And it is, when you were born, were you an artist? Uh, I think that we are all artists. When I think that everyone has a pa- like capacity for creativity. Uh, we just express it in different ways. And sometimes maybe our, our world sort of like discourages us. But uh, my very first memories are of uh, coloring in a coloring book with my mom. And so uh, I definitely like feel like those are my first sort of ways that I oriented myself to the world is through images. And so, um, yeah, I, I still continue to think in that way and think about how I can make images that communicate the things in my mind and um, how I can help other people communicate their ideas through images. So, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely in my, it's in my like blood, my DNA, but I also, um, this was actually part of my thesis work was talking about this like, um, sort of bias that humans have towards images and that we actually prefer images to text like any day we and and that images actually can carry so much more information than a piece of text can we can read all of these abstract sort of subtexts and symbolisms from art and so um there's something about that that i think not only connects to me, but also connects all the way back to like, you know, the cave art or the, you know, caves of Lascaux in France, which are some of the oldest works we know, um, you know, that humans have been making images for as long as we've been human. So I feel like it's a part of what we do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and thank you for that. I, um, as a deep part of the show, um, and, and I'm always interested in education and, and development. I just, it's, 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 it's really a, a wonder to kind of encounter how folks, you know, connected to art, what they think about, you know, from, from early on, uh, and identity and identifying as such, or as, as, as creators. Now, um, uh, Steph, I, I had mentioned, um, your, your artwork and, um, I wanted to tell you my my impression or just what struck me. I mean, I um, I thought that the images were just the, the color and and they were just beautiful and gorgeous. But there's one piece um, that I I wanted to hear from you and see what I'm seeing. It's um, uh, it was the uh, some flourishes of a little bit more of a pop appeal, like a very like a fresh. Um, kind of like popular cultural uh, appeal to it, and um, is that something that that that's an intent of an intent of yours? Um, because I've seen that one of the things that I've loved, and just to be particular about it, is um, indigenous art and images, and then um, even sometimes overtly like pop culture built into that and mm-hmm. um, developed that way. Um, was I seeing the the pop pieces in there, or could you describe um, when you're creating what you know what 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 you're getting towards? Yeah, I, I'm like smiling just because you you read very well into my intentions, and so I appreciate that. As an artist, you're always like hoping that um, some of those themes come through. Um, I definitely was inspired by, um, you know, sort of the pop art era of modern art, um, you know, thinking about people like Andy Warhol and a lot of the op art artists who made more like graphic 
images that maybe weren't representational, but just playing with line and weight and color. And um, color is something that's really important in my work. And the, and, uh, the choices in color that I make are, are very intentional because um, much of indigenous representation, when we think about the ways in which historically Native people have been represented, were typically represented one um, in the past and so uh, we are never really represented in contemporary times. When people think about indigenous people, they see us as like existing somewhere in the past somewhere, but not really now. And so um, the use of the kind of color palettes that I um, tend to go towards, which are, you know, neons and fully saturated color um, is a way to bring our representations into the contemporary um, because those colors aren't associated with the past. They're associated with now and also associated neons in particular are sort of associated with industrialism and like, construction. So you think about, you know, the city, you think about urban sort of life. Um, and so those colors also hint at me as a person. Like um, I was lucky enough that I grew up in my ancestral homeland. I didn't grow up on the reservation, which was about an hour and a half away from where I, I grew up, but I was close enough to it and my family lived very close to it. So I sort of like kind of lived in between two worlds. And so my work is very much trying to like show that, that um, connection to past. So I use a lot of traditional motifs or styles, but then I also just like bring it in the full color um, and that reference to that contemporary modern or pop art, in it, as you might think of it, um, those are ways for me to bring indigenous sort of um, existence into the future. And, and that concept of indigenous futurism, it can be really subtly done just through the use of color. And um, that's how, uh, how deeply we've been erased from American consciousness is that we're typically only represented in sepia tone. So <laughs> the yeah. color is really a way to sort of strike against the thing that you're expecting. Yeah, that is. Um, thank you for saying uh, for saying that and explaining that. I mean, I really think it's a a profound and, and, and subtle point, and it has to do with 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 time and, and and representation. I've seen the documentary Real Engine about you know representations, and um, one of the things that I you know I've considered myself over time to be you know um, you know a progressive you know white identifying uh, male and you know sympathetic, but um, what's happened during the podcast and being uh, having the the great pleasure of talking to indigenous artists has uh, been to completely radicalize my uh, perspective or like my knowledge of how much. Here's the one thought step that always disturbs me, right? And you get a curious mind as well. But having curiosity and being introspective about what you encounter, but then you find this patches and patches of areas where you just were spoon fed some horse shit and like you just you just took it and and you didn't like you might not realize that you did and that's been a very big experience and on the point that you said exactly as i got into talking to indigenous artists uh from different nations and seeing the art and seeing not just art but just seeing the culture i was like holy shit, there is so much here. And then I've, I've gone through like the psychological stages of my own thing of like betrayal being like, what the hell is this? And Will Rogers was a native American. Like I found that out four days ago. I'm, I'm it's, it's all around. So um, I do appreciate like you saying about the colors and, and how you're trying to bring in as being like, Hey, this was made recently. And it looks Super Martin in now, right? Um, thank you for thank you for that. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, and um, is is the philosophical uh, question we go into the conceptual here is, um, you produce a lot of beautiful art. You studied art. You've done thesis on art, but what is art? 
uh, art is everything. So um, that actually was a, one of my favorite things that I learned in art school was that um, there was a school of thought that said that li everything is art. Every single thing we do, the thing we're doing right now is art. Um, there's no question about that. It is what it is. And also when you go and brush your teeth, that's an art too. And so when you asked me the question originally about, you know, have I always been an artist that that question makes me, you know, inside, I know secretly what you don't know is that, you know, you're an artist too, and we're all artists and maybe you're an artist at, at, um, you know, keeping people's fucking books in order, or maybe you're a, you're a software engineer. I work, um, I actually, write for Intel. And so I'm a tech writer and I, and I, I'm not a huge tech person, but I work with people who are engineers and programmers. And so those people, they use the same kind of critical thinking skills that artists use, but they're writing software or, you know, they're designing a computer. And so um, I recognize those things in all of us. And so, uh, yeah, for me, uh, everything is art. Uh, and and you don't have to even agree with me. You can't escape the fact that it is. And that's um, what m one of my favorite things that I've learned is that I can really see the world in this really beautiful way because even the ugliest things that happen in this world are art. And 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 there's so much ugly art. I mean, we all know, we've all seen ugly art, right? <laughs> so we can say like, oh yeah, the that thing that I saw on the news today, that was some really ugly art. And I can think about it critically. And actually that's also a key component of um, going to art school is learning to think critically about yourself and also about how the world sees you in your work. And so um, as an artist, like, um, you know, I feel very blessed to know that I'm an artist, but you also don't like, you don't have to go to school to be an artist. I have always been an artist. Uh, I waited until I was in my very late twenties to go back to art school. Um, and so I was like kind of a weirdo at art school because I was amongst a bunch of you know, um, trust fund babies, essentially. <laughs> and I was a poor kid who got an Indian scholarship. <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't supposed to be there. And yeah. so, yeah, but what I realized is that in my core, in my heart, yeah, I'm an artist. Um, and it's, it's something that I'm just, you know, dedicated to every day. But people do those same things. They just do it in different ways. You know, like what you do and your, your work, you're an artist in your own way. And there are things that you do that you probably do very artfully that no one else could do. And so, um, yeah, I see everyone. I try to tell everyone they're an artist. Whenever I figure out what the thing is that they do, I'm like, oh yeah, you're an artist, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think there's like, I think the terms, I think, you know, terms, like art or creativity or being a creative or making things. There's so many processes that humans engage in that are intricate, I guess. There are multiple pieces um, to them. I wanted to ask a follow-up question to the, the, the what, uh, what is art? And given your answer, it might be, it might be a, a tiny bit of a tricky one, but I, I just want you to hear from you what the role of art is, right? It's super important. And if we are artists, um, when we're talking about art or, or, or interacting with art, uh, what is the role of art for human beings? Like, why do? what's going on there? So that is a great question. And especially when you think about the fact that everything is art, all right? So, um, but art has many different roles. Like it doesn't just serve one purpose. Um, the art that I make serves a different purpose than someone that, you know, um, comes from a completely different place in the world, you know? And I learned that when I went to art school. So, you know, coming into a place where I came to art school because art had saved my life. Art actually made me feel value in myself. And so um, it actually made me want to like um, try to contribute something to the world as opposed to the path that I was on prior to that. And so, um, you know, for me, uh, my purpose in art is to use my art to better the world because art bettered me and to like educate people through art and empower people through art. 
But there are, um, you know, there are all kinds of ways to engage with art that like you can engage with it in very abstract ways and that have nothing to do with politics uh, or, you know, supposedly have nothing to do with politics, but everything is political. So, um, you know, there, there are many ways to use art and there are ways that are very passive. Um, the ways that I use art and its purpose for me um, is usually like trying to, to create positive impact. And so, um, you know, like I said, a lot of my work around representation of indigenous people and like bringing things into the contemporary world, um, that's my purpose, right? Is like, uh, I grew up with no representation. The representation of indigenous people that I had were in like John Wayne movies and um, like Pocahontas. And so, um, you know, for me, uh, Pocahontas didn't look nothing like my auntie and my grandma. And so I, <laughs> I didn't relate to these representations that I was being given. And so um, I know now as an artist that part of my purpose is to like fill those gaps that I recognized when I needed those representations. Yep. And I see now as I'm making them that, yeah, we still need them really badly. And so um, that's why I have to keep making the work because people need it. And um, so that's my purpose. But um, art can f serve many different purposes. And so that's actually the beauty of it is that it can be as functional as a car or, uh, you know, the design of a tire. But um, it can also just be a beautiful image as well. Yeah, I... Uh... And mentioned in, in in the media and the representations, I think um, I just I, f for me, I want to mention like reservation dogs, right? Like it's tough for me to have a conversation about that in the sense where, like, I want to be like, "Hey, this is like a real show, and this is the reservation." And I'm listening to others say, "I don't pretend to have any, you know," but it, it feels real, and it, it it brings in a diversity of characters, and it brings in the creative talent, whether it's somebody holding, you know, the, the sound mic or the writer or the incredible actors and actresses, or even seeing a major network like NBC with Rutherford Falls with, uh, with a lot of, um, in, uh, indigenous uh, creators. But I'm like, this isn't the last year or two, right? Like I, for me, and like looking at these, for me, if I'm just like a consumer of media and art, I want like, I want enough indigenous shows so I can refer to five crappy indigenous shows and like 12 good ones and others I haven't seen. And so it's, it's great to see this right now, but the only, what I'm left with is like more and more let's have regular or real or, and uh, it's for me, it feels for me in my own little way, it feels like a good time to, to see this, but also to push and be like, um, need a lot more, need a lot more, want a lot more because the stories are, are, are that, are that good. Um, what are your impressions of, you know, I, I gave a couple examples that I've seen that are in popular media. What, what are your impressions of, is something different going on now? Is this, are we headed towards something that's better and more reasonable or I mean at least as representation goes yeah I think um it's really exciting to see shows like Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls because um you know those are people that are are in our you know in our larger community and um like Jana, who's the star of Rutherford Falls, the, the female lead, Jana actually was in my very first curated exhibition. And so um, I collect her beadwork. I think that, you know, I think she's an amazing human being. And then she became friggin' famous. And so I'm like, I get to see people in my own community, like, reaching their dreams. And that is, again, it goes back to this idea of representation for our community because because we have been erased for so long. And, and when you said, I didn't know, I didn't know about all of these things. It's like, you weren't 
you weren't supposed to. And, and that was by design, like a lot of things, um, you know, connected to white supremacy, many of the marginalized stories become invisible because that's how you maintain white supremacy. Yeah. So you can't know about genocide because if you knew that America committed its own genocide, you would probably be more critical of the things that it's doing abroad, you know? And so there was great care taken to yeah. erase those things. So now as we're seeing them on the screen, it's very exciting, but you know what? These folks, they've been working their ass off for yeah. years. They've been doing this for decades. A lot of them have been working for 15, 20 years on, you know, stand up circuits or writing in writer's rooms and stuff. And they're just finally now, getting the space to tell our stories. And so it's very exciting, but it is like, I think, um, you know, some of it can definitely be attributed to the George Floyd protests. I feel like when, when things started to happen around those things, people became like a little bit more awake somehow yeah. and, and, and are wanting to engage in these conversations. And so I think there's like, there are multiple sort of layers of things happening right now and people are becoming more aware. And so that's, that's great. And I'm happy to like have those conversations because we've been waiting to have, we've been having them by ourselves for so long. We're so excited to engage with other people on them. <laughs> yeah. I, um, well, it, the timing of this too is within the last week, there was a new book out um, and I might have the title slightly off, but as we, we had a, we had a slight real estate problem or we had a real estate problem and it was about native comedy. And um, it was, I listened to it as nine and a half hours long. And so for me, all right, typical reaction, somebody would be like, Oh, native comedian, name one can't do ever hear that you know what i mean like you'd be st most people in the popular culture would be stymied and as i got into it and listened to it and heard about what you were talking about of toil like these folks have been around making people last laugh their asses off like going from reservation to reservation or going to a particular place and doing two big sh big shows a year they've been humping it they've been doing mm -hmm. doing the work and, and it's great to see you know it, it more folks getting exposed to it and, and their hard work paying off. And Jana, who I think is ridiculously hilarious. And I start laughing as soon as she, like, as, as soon as she opens her mouth, um, as she's, as she's fantastic, but a lot of great people working hard and, and getting some time uh, to, you know, to display their talents, which goodness gracious, Steph should happen. Right. <laughs> Shouldn't it happen? Right. If you have the, you know, proof of concept and you get a great idea and people laugh no matter who you are. Shouldn't you have the time, I guess? Um, anyways, uh, some better TV is out right now, I guess, is, 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 is where we, uh, is where we arrived at. Um, one of the things, uh, I, I wanted to ask, um, and it's, it's related to, um, some of the things that I mentioned and um, in, in, in a little bit more of kind of the uh, origin or, or going back to the beginning away from the creativity question. And it's a way for me to kind of find out about influences. But I was wondering, uh, Steph Littlebird, uh, who or what made you who you are? Oh, man, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, I am made by my 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 predecessors for sure. Um, I always, the people that I keep with me every day are my, particularly as my grandmother, who is an indigenous woman. But, um, you know, I keep with me the people that like shared kindness with me in my life because I did not grow up with a lot of that. My, my upbringing was not that great. And so the, the positive people who did shine a light in my life are the people who keep me going. Um, and so a lot of the work that I do is very much in like 
whenever I'm sort of approaching any project, I'm thinking about my community. I'm thinking about my own personal family, but I'm also thinking about my relatives is what we would say just to like the extended indigenous community. Like, you know, I have a responsibility to them. And so um, I'm very much inspired by and also work in honor of um, those people who are living and also those people who have passed on. And so, um, you know, that's a huge inspiration for me. But then I'm also just inspired by artists and by creators generally and people who are um, manifesting new things for this world, you know, and um, especially, you know, thinking about some of the struggles that we're going through as a, you know, in the American culture, just, you know, if you want to be that specific specific is like we're going through some identity stuff right now and we're really working through white supremacy and maybe not working through it in some ways and so um you know while there has been all of these um changes uh it's the creators that keep me sort of um hopeful and so um seeing these people who i know who have experienced oppression um indigenous female artists in particular um those are the people that sort of like keep me going and keep me like wanting to do better for myself and for others and so yeah ultimately it's like my indigenous community and my artist community they keep me sort of in check and also on the path to you know keep making and keep creating yeah, thank you. Um, one of the one of the points uh, that that you had mentioned was about um, about uh, some of the things we come in contact or within uh, you know within dominant American culture, or white culture, and and the things that aren't brought up to um, I don't know make us uncomfortable or hearing. One of the things about uh, about my reading recently was learning deep stories about um, allies and indigenous folks and a whole bunch of folks, and they could be in Hollywood and other places, putting in for the struggle. And you would never, ever hear about it. You would never hear the names of like somebody was a producer on a show and being like, hey, I'm going to give you the space to do this in this way and like helping out that. And it, it, your point in saying like that's not brought out is like because as a thinker, I think always like I want the information. I want to know what happened. What is the history? But as you point out, with the power of what happened or didn't happen or I didn't know that this person and you don't hear stories of folks helping each other out. You don't hear folks of somebody from here saying, I don't care where you're from and putting in and putting themselves on whoever they are. And I find it so difficult. Uh, I know you're an activist and, and, and I am myself to, 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 to figure out, to get at those stories, to put in the time and to learn and to then tell others about it. Right. Did you know about the occupation of uh, Alcatraz and do you know many elements of that and why it happened and how it developed and um, and we're, uh, we're we're left um, uh, without that I try in the show and of course I'm talking to you to get like for me it's a self and deep interest but um, there's a lot of wonder um, there's a lot of wonder uh, in learning uh, uh, to be done um and thank you for coming on to the philosophy in 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 art in art podcast and 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 helping me out with this. Um, we're talking with Steph Littlebird, and uh, I am uh, talking her from actually the historical lands of the Kalapuya tribe, and uh, we're talking about art and philosophy and uh, how we come to be. Uh, I wanted to ask a, a separate question, uh, Steph, and I didn't give you a heads up on this, but it's related kind of to our times or fast moving uh, uh, events in how it seems that politics is becoming radicalized and intense and an extreme. One of the, the question I wanted to ask you is, how do you um, derive meaning uh, from these quick moving events, for like these events that are going on. I see a lot of folks and no fault of their own, whether it's, you know, 
uh, a cognitive or traumatized. There's so much change. I can't understand it. But how do you personally uh, or as an artist derive meaning from what's going down right now? Uh, I think that I always try to remain rooted in history um, whenever I'm thinking about what's happening now uh, and, and trying to think about the people who I am descended from and what they experienced. Um, you know, my, not just my immediate predecessors, like my parents, but, you know, my predecessors who were colonized and, and thinking about um, all of the violent experiences that has sort of happened to previous generations that came before me, not just indigenous people, but all, all kinds of people who've been oppressed in this country, you know, um, and so uh, when I see what's going on in the world right now and I see how polarized things are, you know, I feel I feel troubled by it. Um, but I also I also kind of like am reassured by the the, the sort of trajectory of human um I don't know, human history having you know like there is always going to be struggles. There are always going to be sort of stumbling blocks and we're not always going to be perfect in our ascent to the, you know, the next evolved state. But what we are now is far more informed. And I also think that, you know, uh, we are in a sort of unprecedented world. And so there are things that we can't really predict, but um, I feel like knowing yourself and knowing who you, you know, who you are in terms of like where you come from, um, those things can kind of give you a stability in a sense. And knowing that I descend from people who, you know, were violently colonized and survived that, um, that I, that, whatever I'm doing right now, like I have the, like the pre-coded sort of experience in my DNA from my ancestors to survive that shit. So, um, you know, I just keep working away and trying to put my positive light into the world because, um, that's all we can do. Right. Is like when you are facing down the fucking gun of a barrel, that is tyranny that is absolutely knocking on this country's door right now. Um, then you, you have to like remain positive because if you don't have that vision for a better future, then everything deteriorates very quickly. And so, um, you know, I don't know, I just have to just stay, uh, focused on, you know, my purpose. Cause that's really the only thing that's sort of like, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. like, there's a lot going on right now in this world. And we're in a very strange time. You know, people keep saying post pandemic, but we are not in a post pandemic. We still have right. 50 to 70,000 people being affected every single day. And so, um, you know, uh, we've just become desensitized. And so, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. We're in a, we're in a world right now that's hard to sort of predict, but, um, I stay sort of tethered to reality through my ancestry and, um, doing my purpose every day, which is to create work, uh, for my community and, um, you know, for others that uplifts them because that's what we need right now. <laughs> yeah. And, and thank you. And I want to connect uh, what you just said right there to, um, collective activity. And, and we, we, we chatted, uh, you know, prior to the to episode a little bit about collective activity and, uh, working together. Um, you and I must believe that when you take art and you take people, that that there must be some power to collectively organize um, around it. And I'm not saying just overtly for political purposes, right? You know, that, that which has its own uses in means of political imagery. I'm saying the power of art in in organizing to 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 help transform. I'm assuming that your art is integral to your organizing. So I want to ask this. The, when we organize, must it be artful? I, I don't think we can ever really count on being artful as humans. <laughs> so we should never like, we should never um, aspire to only be artful. Like perfectionism is not, 
it's not great. Uh, it's a tough, tough rule to live under. But um, I think that it's not important to be perfect. It's important to try. And yeah. so a lot of people ask me that when I talk about art, but it's true of activism too, which is like, well, certainly every painting I make is not going to be a masterpiece, but it doesn't mean I don't paint that painting because that painting that I made that isn't a masterpiece, well, that teaches me how to make the masterpiece. And so um, as we talked earlier about collectivism, like sometimes our collective actions are, are a very small microcosm and they don't impact the world the way that we say would want them to, but it's that action, it's that collectivism that keeps that flame of revolution and change alive. And so we have to keep um, putting coal on the fire, right? We got to keep putting fuel into it to keep it alive because um, sometimes the fire isn't burning that bright, but as long as it's burning, then there's potential for it to, you know, to come back up again. And so anyway, yeah, that's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. But, uh, it doesn't have to be artful. It just has to happen. <laughs> yeah. I found one of the best, uh, one of the best lessons, you know, I learned a long time ago, but to, to teach folks, um, organizing or like collective activity around a cause is so clumsy and sloppy. I don't even have the words for it. And people don't expect that going in. They expect to be like, where, where, where am I supposed to be standing? And where is that? And you're like, they keep, and folks will look at you and you'll be like, look, your attitude has to be this. You have to constantly adapt because we're in a new thing constantly and um it's it's quite a, a funny thing to think about it in that way because i think we're kind of trained to think of okay what are the instructions what is gonna work and we're like guess what as we're going along here we're gonna find what works as we're doing it so yeah i mean a painting is an, a painting is a series of thousands of decisions right so like when i make a painting i have to consciously and also subconsciously just paint these layers of color essentially to achieve something that looks like a thing later on yeah. you know and so really there's no roadmap to that that's just kind of like you gotta go with it and like you said be able to adapt adaptability being dynamic super important when it comes to organizing or being an artist generally because if you're not willing to experiment like these the the lives we lead as activists and artists are typically the like the sort of overgrown paths they're not cleared for you you kind of got to make it on your own and so yeah. you have to be a creative mind either way yeah yeah and um well and part of the thing i think in in, in mentioning art or you know the art of that uh but also um you know, uh, thinking about uh, philosophy and, and asking questions. And, and one of the things that I know in doing the show, I mean, if you look at the history of philosophy, you know, per se, um, not only do you have like a dominant white male narrative, you have one even more dominant in the kind of concepts that are created. Like it seems that philosophy is even more white and, 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 and male. And I think, um, it's problematic, a much more problematic compared to art because yeah, art has that same type of thing, right? So somebody will think of the Guggenheim or like rich people, you know, having a glass of wine in front of a painting. But you and I know that there's a ton of art and there's a bunch of other things, um, um, you know, uh, there's just there's just a whole lot more um, that that is there, and I think about history. I think you were mentioned in, in talking about history. That that history is there, and one of the things I try to do in this show, which is 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 kind of a an interesting experiment almost, is that type of philosophy or that type of esoteric learning the language, particular um, language is so exclusionary it's i mean, think it's self i think it's noticeably self it's just exclusionary and when you popularize philosophy of saying like what is art or like why am i here like everybody can get to the point in talking about that and not create the argument necessarily but to talk about um 
to talk about big questions. Um, in thinking about philosophy, and I know you know we we you studied history and, and doing philosophy. What is it like to not see, at least formally in formal education, you know, representation of thought systems and in, in, in thinking within 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 academics? And what does that mean for us? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, what I would say to what you were just saying about how philosophy and art are kind of separate, I will argue that actually those are the same audiences in terms of um the pedigree of people who can study those things, they're coming from the same place a lot of the times. And so mm -hmm. um, when I went to art school, I didn't know a whole lot about philosophy, but I came in to, um, to be in class with these kids who were like 19, but they'd gone to a magnet school. And so they had learned philosophy and they knew about, um, you know, th words I had never even heard before. And sure. so I had to sure. catch up because I came from the country. I came from a, a town of 500 people. So we weren't talking about philosophy in, ju in junior high or high school. <laughs> right. You know, right. Um, but those, uh, you know, the, I don't know, I think that they sort of, the institutions of thought that they have created around them, that elitist vocabulary, very much um, sort of like, the same functionality and um, and actually much of philosophy travels into art history. So when we think about concepts um, in art history known as like the sublime, yeah. um, there's a visual school of the sublime, but then there's a manual Kant or Kant who wrote about the sublime. And so that's actually where the school of the visual sublime comes from. And yeah. so, um, you know, it's like, it, to it totally infects the way we're trained as artists as well. So um, they aren't separate, but I'm like, no, I lost. I don't know what you're No, it's doing. fine. Once you, I, I started to, hey, uh, Steph, once you got to Immanuel Kant and get into critique of judgment, I, like I started to latch on to this. And I say, how the hell did we get there? <laughs> Immanuel Kant and, you know, uh, but no, it, you were saying, and, and, and I, appreciate, I appreciate your comments because I see, I see what, what you're saying. You're saying, uh, you know, so this is kind of cut from the from the same cloth. There is a there is no matter how you approach philosophy and art, a dominant elitist exclusionary piece to it. And I, um, with what you're talking about, is something that that I experienced because I was very much. Um, a working class kid doesn't pronounce his R's well from Rhode Island uh, and, and a smart kid, but not prepared or knowledgeable of going in, into those type of things. And then seeing the type of people were there, they were either traditional religious scholars from a tradition or a Christian tradition, or they were white men and studied already in philosophy where the way I approached it, um, well, I it didn't lead me to a career. In it. <laughs> it, it led us to uh, me doing a podcast with you, with you, and uh, and, and and labor organizing. But um, I, I do uh, I do know what you mean in uh, access, and I can't imagine what some of your experience were trying to have a conversation about making art with uh, some some of those folks in that environment i was gonna say um back to the color conversation um throughout my art school experience my teachers particularly my painting teachers were like why why do you want to use neon all the time like why do you want to use these colors and um, and I think it's because many of them were hippies. And so they saw my color use as a drug reference because they were thinking about like the Grateful Dead or something. Okay. And the thing is, is if you've ever been to a contemporary powwow, then you will see all of my palettes in our regalia. And so um, everything is so brightly colored and reflective. And so um, neons are present in all of our regalia now because 
it's a mixture of tradition and contemporary materials. And so my colors are very much a reference to that. But I actually just had this conversation with somebody who's doing um, uh, a, a sort of an exhibition overseas and talking about elitism and how um, in the art institution that even down to color, the idea of white supremacy is enforced. So when you go into a gallery space, it, it, all of the walls must be painted white. And there is a very specific type of white that you should have. And there are all these rules about how a, a painting should be hung at a certain level on the wall, 60 inches on center specifically, because that's the perfect height. And so there are all these, these secret rules that white men have created, essentially, yeah. that are enforced upon, um, you know, creatives, no matter where they come from. And in, in you know, a lot of cases, like indigenous artists, we may have gone to art school, so, uh, like some of us were lucky enough to get into those institutions, but like, we very much were not a part of those institutions and felt right. like aliens in them because our approach to the work is so different than, um, you know, somebody who's coming in there and they're like, I had a, there was a student I went to school with and one of his very first projects in school, in our sculpture class, we had to make a sculpture and bring it in to have it critiqued. And he bought a hamburger and put it on a pedestal and we had to critique it. And, and it was totally valid. It was totally valid. I spent hours and hours and hours making a sculpture and he went and bought a hamburger and talked about it for 30 minutes. And so um, there are many different ways in which white supremacy plays out in art institution and privilege plays out, plays out because that person can get a better grade than I did because they knew how to talk about it in the right language. And so there are all these barriers that indigenous people experience in those institutions, people of color generally experience, and also just poor people. Um, when you get anywhere near those institutions, you recognize that you did not, you didn't come with the prepackaged vocabulary and privilege you were supposed to have to be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the things in the systems that that I found out, I've mentioned this publicly at times, is, you know, I represent everybody when I as I work for a union. I don't I don't choose my clients, and and as such. Um, I, you know, I've worked in a large school system where I knew every black person, right? I knew every person of color. Why? Because they're going to get in trouble. They're, they're, they're not going to fit in. They're going to do the same thing that the other person down the hall did, except now they get a reprimand for it. So it's one of those things where I, I feel, I feel it's been a gift to see how the system doesn't work from, from the inside in because I'm talking to the folks who sometimes who aren't fitting into it and they're telling me why um, uh, they, they don't. And um, uh, but um, one of the, one of the things I wanted to, um, uh, well, I keep saying one of the things I want to ask you uh, <laughs> a lot, uh, Steph. Um, I wanted to ask you a unique uh, question and I, one of your pieces of art become popularized um, recently, um, as far as, uh, a design you've done and, um, for, um, uh, Jubal ale, um, it was a seasonal ale and I know I, I don't drink myself. Um, I quit drinking a, a, a while back, but what I wanted, to, what I wanted to mention is I thought it was, I had such a cool experience seeing that and then like seeing it out there and I'm like, oh my gosh, that I know that. I also know that for artists, it can be kind of a a thing because it seems bigger uh, than, you know, what you've done. Would you mind just talking a little bit about your experience of like now folks come in and say, hey, I see your art here and I saw it here and I saw it down at the corner. So I was just wondering if you could mention about that. Yeah, it's, it's weird to navigate. Um, you know, uh, it's like the Jubileo label is weird because I'm not really a, I'm not a beer person or, you know, like um, I'm also conscious of the fact that my community, indigenous community struggles with alcoholism. I, I have alcoholics in my family. And so um, I took the job 
um, after very clearly articulating to them that I would not be giving them like indigenous aesthetics to use on their products, that they would be hiring me as a designer. And yeah. so, um, you know, that's sort of the way that I approach that job in particular, because, um, I'll, you know, the one thing about being in demand and having people want your art is that you have to then be more discerning about the people that you let have your art, right? Because when you're, when I was a young artist and nobody wanted my art, I was like, here, some of us, just somebody <laughs> take my art, you know? Yeah. Um, and now I'm like, oh, no, wait, I don't want you to have my art because I don't agree with what you do. And, um, or I don't, um, or maybe they didn't treat me ethically, those sorts of things. And so yeah. I have to navigate that a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people want to tokenize me and call me on, you know, November 1st because they forgot it's in, you know, Native American heritage month and they need something native or whatever. And so um, there are like ways in which that crops up that are sort of um, frustrating and sort of whatever. But I also am like, I recognize that just as an artist, I'm extremely privileged to have so many people that I have to say no to, you know? So um, I, I know what it's like to be a, a working and starving artist. And so to now be like, I can't, I'm sorry, you know, the Washington Post ap approached me for some shit a couple of weeks ago and I was like, I can't, you you guys give me like two weeks turnaround and I'm busy, so I'm sorry, but that's a really cool thing to say no to, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's, a bless it's a blessing and a curse and, and learning to discern and, and set boundaries with people, particularly non-Indigenous entities has been a, a big lesson for me, for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and thank you for that. I I wanted to tell you about my, I was like, wow, I love looking at that. I was so excited by it. And I'm sure many people who, you know, love you and, and love your art are having, you know, uh, that experience and being able to see it, uh, um, you know, a bit more, um, a bit more publicly, I, I guess. Um, uh, uh, I, I keep saying it's like a one more thing. And then, then I got another thing. I want to ask you the big question, uh, though. Um, I want to, I want to ask you the, the, the big question, uh, and then maybe a couple smaller ones. The big question is why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? I will say one other comment about the question. It can be asked. How is there something rather than nothing when people are saying, of course, there's something. I never want to presume the answer, but uh, which is it? Something or nothing or both? <laughs> both, for sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, when I was younger, I would say this a lot. I don't say it as much anymore, but I used to, it depended on the day. Some days I woke up like very hopeful. And some days I woke up a nihilist and like nothing mattered, you know? And so, um, nihilism has its place in some ways, like, <laughs> but I also think that, um, that idea that nothing matters is also t tied to white supremacy. And I think that the idea that, um, you know, uh, that we don't have to take responsibility for our actions and, and own up when we make mistakes is like such a core part of the American psyche, which is also why we can't address climate change and we can't address genocide or oppression because, um, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's actually, sort of picking at something that is very much tied to white supremacy. And so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a, that's a tough question. I, I, my purpose is what I make. And, and like I said earlier, my purpose is, in, is like working to right the wrongs that happened to my ancestors and also work for the people now. So, you know, when you ask that question, I liken it to what's the, like, what's the meaning of life yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, um, the answer to that question is not the same for every person and that, um, we make meaning. And that's what I have. That's, that's the difference between me now and me as a younger person is that some days I woke up as a nihilist and those were the days that I chose not to make the day have meaning. And so, yeah every day I have to choose to make my day have meaning and purpose. And, and really that's what keeps me here 
as yeah. it just like living. So um, that's my guiding purpose really is that I have, I have to make the meaning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, uh, I, I, I feel that. And, and thank you. And thank you for your response. Um, uh, before, before I kind of hand it over to you to kind of tell folks, you know, where to find you, cause I want them to be able to find you in, in your art. One of the things I wanted to say, uh, Steph, is that, you know, on this show, um, I've had, um, indigenous guests and, uh, indigenous women. And one of the things that I found to be a great gift that's been given to me is I know that I can represent in general, a very risky proposition to have a conversation with somebody you don't know, uh, white male, uh, you know, 49, I'm, I'm struggling with my age. I mention my age all the time now trying to grapple with it. I didn't do it as much before, but I know that there's this, there's this, uh, that there's this step, um, uh, that you take. And, and I, I, I really just want to recognize that. And for, I've talked to Jordan Marie, uh, brings three horse, uh, Daniel, um, Rosalie fish and, uh, Raven Juarez. And, um, part of my engagement is that my show is open and I'm deeply curious and I'm deeply curious where, I don't know. I really don't know. And I'm learning a lot at the time. But fundamentally, what I wanted to say is thank you, you know, for coming uh, on the show and to, for taking that step, um, because it's something that I notice and it's something that I appreciate. Yeah, I, I will say that it, it can be a risk for sure. But um, when you said that you had recently been radicalized by indigenous people, I was like, all right, <laughs> I'm in, I'm coming. <laughs> that is the that is the only is the only word, and I use it in the most beautiful non-American radicalization threatening way, even though it's, it's, it should be threatening as fuck because you're questioning fundamentally the structures that are around you. But um, yeah, and that has happened. And um, being in a process where I'm like, okay, how do I do today? How do I learn? And how do I, how, how do I figure this out? And how do I see, see, you know, and uh, with, with see the art, and, and also here in the conversation. Um, all right, so Steph, um, I will tell you that um, I already, I, I mentioned you coming on to the show with the producer. He's been ordering your art already. This is, you know, the, the show hasn't even been produced yet. He'll, <laughs> he's excited about it. But um, could you tell um, the listeners, you know, where to find, uh, you know, your art or or maybe any other aspects of your creativity and things you wish to, uh, to express to the audience. Yeah. Um, if you want to look at my art, the best place to find it is on Instagram. So my handle on there is art nerd forever. Um, all, you know, all spelled, no letters or no numbers, sorry. <laughs> and then um, you, or you can just type in Steph little bird and it'll come up as well. Um, there's also Steph little bird.com where you can see some of my work on there, but yeah, um, yeah, I you can Google me. I got all kinds of projects across the Internet that you can check out. Um, aside from being a visual artist, I'm also a curator and a professional writer. And so um, I'm writing a series right now for Oregon Arts Watch that's about indigenous resilience and about um, indigenous people in Oregon and how they use creativity to sort of bring um, uh, you know, native identity into the, into the present and, um, you know, thinking about those ideas of indigenous futurism. And so, yeah, you can just search Steph Little Bird on Google, you'll find me. And, uh, yeah, I uh, appreciate the time and opportunity to chat with you on this. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the invitation is, since you're art nerd forever, the invitation is forever that corresponds. <laughs> No, I actually tell people that I used to have this post that I put on Instagram and it was called the art hotline. And you could just DM me if you had questions about art or if you wanted me to like look at a piece of art. I still do that for people anyway, but um, I love art so much. And like I said, it, art is everything. And so even, you know, my my DMs on my Instagram account, that's art. So, you know, DM me and we can make art together. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Steph. Um, as you know, I've uh, been really excited to um, to chat with you, and actually, as usual, to you know learn as I'm as as I'm talking. And uh, I hope everybody gets a chance to take a look at um, uh, Steph's art. Uh, I really enjoy it, and I look forward to um, uh, you know the, those pieces. But also, what you were saying about um, your writing. Uh, and, um, about, uh, the connection between, you know, activity and art, um, uh, for this, for the sake of, you know, moving away from theory to the practical component, uh, one of the, the threads, um, I did an interview with, uh, Ricardo Levens, uh, Morales in, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and, um, he really helped me take a jump forward in understanding art activity or creativity, not something that's being pushed into the activity that you're doing. It's an emanation and it, it's, it's part of it. And he pointed to, you know, a lot of effort wasted uh, squishing things in when you have to reposition. And um, I hear a lot of what you have to say there. And for me, that's a very liberating concept because otherwise for me in my own way, I get stuck doing labor stuff over here and now I'm acting arty over here. And now I'm doing this over here when it is like that. It is like that, you know, the capitalist system kind of breaks it into those pieces, but it, it really is me and it really is you. So, um, I heard a lot of what you had to say of, what we're talking about having a real impact uh, on on the world. So, um, shit, right? That's what art collective, you know, conversation is supposed to do. Um, Steph, thank you uh, so much for your time. This is something rather than nothing. 